All About Love, New Visions, written by Bell Hooks, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. This is Chapter 9, Mutuality, The Heart of Love. Quote, True giving is a thoroughly joyous thing to do. We experience happiness when we form the intention to give, in the actual act of giving and in the recollection of the fact that we have given. Generosity is a celebration. When we give something to someone, we feel connected to them, and our commitment to the path of peace and awareness deepens. Unquote. Sharon Salzberg Love allows us to enter paradise. Still, many of us wait outside the gates, unable to cross the threshold, unable to leave behind all the stuff we have accumulated that gets in the way of love. If we have not been guided on love's path for most of our lives, we usually do not know how to begin loving, or what we should do and how we should act. Much of the despair young people feel about love comes from their belief that they are doing everything quote-unquote right, or that they have done everything right and love is still not happening. Their efforts to love and be loved just produce stress, strife, and perpetual discontent. In my twenties and early thirties, I was confident I knew what love was all about. Yet every time I, quote-unquote, fell in love, I found myself in pain. The two most intense partnerships of my life were both with men who are adult children of alcoholic fathers. Neither has memories of interacting positively with his father. Both were raised by divorced working mothers who never married again. They were similar in temperament to my dad, quiet, hard-working, and emotionally withholding. I can remember when I took the first man home. My sisters were shocked that he was, in their eyes, quote, so much like daddy, unquote, and, quote, you've always hated daddy, unquote. At the time, I thought this was ridiculous, both the notion I hated dad and the idea that my chosen life partner was in any way like him. No way. After 15 years with this partner, I realized not only how much he was like Dad, I also came face to face with my desperate longing to get the love from him I had not gotten from my father. I wanted him to become both the loving Dad and a loving partner, thereby offering me a space of healing. In my fantasy, if he would just love me, give me all the care I had not gotten as a child, it would mend my broken spirit and I would be able to trust and love again. He was unable to do this. He had never been schooled in the way of love. Groping in the shadows of love as much as I was, together we made serious mistakes. He wanted from me the unconditional love and service his mother had always given him, without expecting anything in return. Constantly frustrated by his indifference to the needs of others and his smug conviction that this was the way life should be, I tried to do the emotional work for both of us. Needless to say, I did not get the love I longed for. I did get to remain in a familiar, familial place of struggle. We were engaged in a private gender war. In this battle, I fought to destroy the Mars and Venus model so we could break from preconceived ideas about gender roles and be true to our inner longings. He remained wedded to a paradigm of sexual difference that had at its root the assumption that men are inherently different from women, with different emotional needs and longings. In his mind, my problem was my refusal to accept these quote-unquote natural roles. Like many liberal men in the age of feminism, he believed women should have equal access to jobs and be given equal pay, but when it came to matters of home and heart, he still believed caregiving was the female role. Like many men, he wanted a woman to be, quote, just like his mama, unquote, so that he did not have to do the work of growing up. He was the type of man described by psychologist Dan Kiley in his groundbreaking work, The Peter Pan Syndrome, Men Who Have Never Grown Up. Published in the early 80s, the jacket noted that this book was about a serious social psychological phenomenon besetting American males, their refusal to become men. Quote, Though they have reached adult age, they are unable to face adult feelings with responsibilities. Out of touch with their true emotions, afraid to depend on even those closest to them, 
Self-centered and narcissistic, they hide behind masks of normalcy while feeling empty and lonely inside." Unquote. This new generation of American men had experienced the feminist cultural revolution. Many of them had been raised in homes where fathers were not present. They were more than happy when feminist thinkers told them that they did not need to be macho men. But the only alternative to not turning into a conventional macho man was to not become a man at all, to remain a boy. By choosing to remain boys, they did not have to undergo the pain of severing the too tight bonds with mothers who had smothered them with unconditional care. They could just find women to care for them in the same way that their moms had. When women failed to be like mom, they acted out. Initially, as a young militant feminist, I was thrilled to find a man who was not into being the patriarch. And even the task of dragging him kicking and screaming into adulthood seemed worthwhile. In the end, I believed I would have an equal partner, love between peers. But the price I paid for wanting him to become an adult was that he traded in his boyish playfulness and became the macho man I had never wanted to be with. I was the target of his aggression, blamed for cajoling him into leaving boyhood behind, and blamed for his fears that he was not up to the task of being a man. By the time our relationship ended, I had blossomed into a fully self-actualized feminist woman, but I had almost lost my faith in the transformative power of love. My heart was broken. I left the relationship fearful that our culture was not yet ready to affirm mutual love between free women and free men. In my second partnership with a much younger man, similar power struggles surfaced as he grappled with coming into full adulthood in a society where manhood is always equated with dominance. He was not dominating, but he had to confront a world that saw our relationship solely in terms of power, of who was in charge. Whereas some people had often seen my older partner's silence as intimidating and threatening, a sign of his quote-unquote power, my younger partner's silence was usually interpreted as a consequence of my dominance. Initially, I was attracted to this younger partner because his quote-unquote masculinity represented an alternative to the patriarchal norm. Ultimately, however, he did not feel that masculinity affirmed in the larger world, and began to rely more on conventional thinking about masculine and feminine roles, allowing sexist socialization to shape his actions. Observing his struggle, I saw how little support men received when they chose to be disloyal to patriarchy. Although these two liberal men were more than two generations apart, neither had given the question of love much thought. Despite their support of gender equality in the public sphere, privately, deep down, they still saw love as a woman's issue. To them, a relationship was about finding someone to take care of all their needs. In the Mars and Venus gendered universe, men want power and women want emotional attachment and connection. On this planet, nobody really has the opportunity to know love since it is power and not love that is the order of the day. The privilege of power is at the heart of patriarchal thinking. Girls and boys, women and men who have been taught to think this way almost always believe love is not important. Or, if it is, it is never as important as being powerful, dominant, in control, on top, being right. Women who give seemingly selfless adoration and care to the men in their lives appear to be obsessed with quote-unquote love, but in actuality, their actions are often a covert way to hold power. Like their male counterparts, they enter relationships speaking the words of love even as their actions indicate that maintaining power and control is their primary agenda. This does not mean that care and affection are not present. They are. This is precisely why it is so difficult for women, and some men, to leave relationships where the central dynamic is a struggle for power. The fact that this sadomasochistic power dynamic can and usually does coexist with affection, care, tenderness, and loyalty makes it easy for power-driven individuals to deny their agendas, even to themselves. Their positive actions give hope that love will prevail. Sadly, love will not prevail in any situation where one party, 
either female or male, wants to maintain control. My relationships were bittersweet. All the ingredients for love were present, but my partners were not committed to making love the order of the day. When someone has not known love, it is difficult for him to trust that mutual satisfaction and growth can be the primary foundation in a coupling relationship. He may only understand and believe in the dynamics of power, of one up and one down, of a sadomasochistic struggle for domination, and ironically, he may feel quote-unquote safer when he is operating within these paradigms. Intimate with betrayal, he may have a phobic fear of trust. At least when you hold to the dynamics of power, you never have to fear the unknown. You know the rules of the power game. Whatever happens, the outcome can be predicted. The practice of love offers no place of safety. We risk loss, hurt, pain. We risk being acted upon by forces outside our control. When individuals are wounded in the space where they would know love during childhood, that wounding may be so traumatic that any attempt to re-inhabit that space feels utterly unsafe and, at times, seemingly life-threatening. This is especially the case for males. Females, no matter our childhood traumas, are given cultural support for cultivating an interest in love. While sexist logic underlies this support, it still means that females are much more likely to receive encouragement both to think about love and to value its meaning. Our overt longing for love can be expressed and affirmed. This does not, however, mean that women are more able to love than men. Females are encouraged by patriarchal thinking to believe we should be loving, but this does not mean we are any more emotionally equipped to do the work of love than our male counterparts. Afraid of love, many of us focus more on finding a partner. The widespread success of books like The Rules, Time-Tested Secrets for Capturing the Heart of Mr. Right, which encourage women to deceive and manipulate to get a partner, express the cynicism of our times. These books validate the old-fashioned sexist notions of sexual difference and encourage women to believe that no relationship between a man and a woman can be based on mutual respect, openness, and caring. The message they give women is that relationships are always and only about power, manipulation, and coercion, about getting someone else to do what you want them to, even if it is against their will. They teach females how to use feminine wiles to play the game of power, but they do not offer guidelines for how to love and be loved. Much popular self-help literature normalizes sexism. Rather than linking habits of being, usually considered innate, to learned behavior that helps maintain and support male domination, they act as though these differences are not value-laden or political, but are rather inherent and mystical. In these books, male inability and or refusal to honestly express feelings is often talked about as a positive masculine virtue women should learn to accept, rather than a learned habit of behavior that creates emotional isolation and alienation. John Gray refers to this as, quote, men entering their cave, unquote, and posits it as a given that a woman who disturbs her man when he wants isolation will be punished. Gray believes that it is female behavior that needs to change. Self-help books that are anti-gender equality often present women's overinvestment in nurturance as a quote-unquote natural inherent quality rather than a learned approach to caregiving. Much fancy footwork takes place to make it seem that New Age mystical evocations of yin, yang, masculine and feminine androgyny, and so on, are not just the same old sexist stereotypes wrapped in more alluring and seductive packaging. To know love, we must surrender our attachment to sexist thinking in whatever form it takes in our lives. That attachment will always return us to gender conflict, a way of thinking about sex roles that diminishes females and males. To practice the art of loving, we have first to choose love admit to ourselves that we want to know love and be loving, even if we do not know what that means. The deeply cynical who have lost all belief in love's power have to step blindly out on faith. 
In The Path to Love, Deepak Chopra urges us to remember that everything love is meant to do is possible. Quote, The aching need created by lack of love can only be filled by learning anew to love and be loved. We all must discover for ourselves that love is a force as real as gravity, and that being upheld in love every day, every hour, every minute, is not a fantasy. It is intended as our natural state. Unquote. Most males are not told that they need to be upheld by love every day. Sexist thinking usually prevents them from acknowledging their longing for love or their acceptance of a female as their guide on love's path. More often than not, females are taught in childhood, either by parental caregivers or the mass media, how to give the basic care that is part of the practice of love. We are shown how to be empathic, how to nurture, and most important, how to listen. Usually, we are not socialized in these practices so that we can be loving or share knowledge of love with men, but rather so that we can be maternal in relation to children. Indeed, most adult females readily abandon their basic understanding of the ways one shows care and respect, important ingredients of love, to re-socialize themselves so that they can unite with patriarchal partners, male or female, who know nothing about love or the basic rudiments of caregiving. A woman who would never submit to a child calling her abusive names and humiliating her allows such behavior from a man. The respect women demand and uphold in the maternal child bond is deemed not important in adult bondings if demanding respect from a man interferes with their desire to get and keep a partner. Few parental caregivers teach their children to lie, yet continual lying either through overt deception or withholding is often deemed acceptable and excusable adult male behavior. Choosing to be honest is the first step in the process of love. There is no practitioner of love who deceives. Once the choice has been made to be honest, then the next step on love's path is communication. Writing about the importance of listening in The Healing of America, Marianne Williamson calls attention to philosopher Paul Tillich's insistence that the first responsibility of love is to listen. Quote, we cannot learn to communicate deeply until we learn to listen to each other, but also to ourselves and to God. Devotional silence is a powerful tool for the healing of a heart or the healing of a nation. From there, we move up to the next rung on the ladder of healing, our capacity to so communicate our authentic truth, to heal and be healed by its power. To the next rung on the ladder of healing, our capacity to so communicate our authentic truth as to heal and be healed by its power. Unquote. Listening does not simply mean we hear other voices when they speak, but that we also learn to listen to the voice of our own hearts as well as inner voices. Getting in touch with the lovelessness within and letting that lovelessness speak its pain is one way to begin again on love's journey. In relationships, whether heterosexual or homosexual, the partner who is hurting often finds that their mate is unwilling to quote-unquote hear the pain. Women often tell me that they feel emotionally beaten down when their partners refuse to listen or talk. When women communicate from a place of pain, it is often characterized as quote-unquote nagging. Sometimes women hear repeatedly that their partners are quote, sick of listening to this shit. Unquote. Both cases undermine self-esteem. Those of us who are wounded in childhood often were shamed and humiliated when we expressed hurt. It is emotionally devastating when the partners we have chosen will not listen. Usually, partners who are unable to respond compassionately when hearing us speak our pain, whether they understand it or not, are unable to listen because that expressed hurt triggers their own feelings of powerlessness and helplessness. Many men never want to feel helpless or vulnerable. They will at times choose to silence a partner with violence rather than witness emotional vulnerability. When a couple can identify this dynamic, they can work on the issue of caring, listening to each other's pain by engaging in short conversations at appropriate times, i.e. it's useless to try and speak your pain to someone who is bone-weary, irritable, preoccupied, etc. 
setting a time when both individuals come together to engage in compassionate listening enhances communication and connection. When we are committed to doing the work of love, we listen even when it hurts. M. Scott Peck's popular treatise, The Road Less Traveled, highlighted and affirmed the importance of commitment. Discipline and devotion are necessary to the practice of love, all the more so when relationships are just beginning. Peck writes, quote, Whether it be shallow or not, commitment is the foundation, the bedrock of any genuinely loving relationship. Deep commitment does not guarantee the success of the relationship, but does help more than any other factor to ensure it. Anyone who is truly concerned for the spiritual growth of another knows, consciously or instinctively, that he or she can significantly foster that growth only through a relationship of constancy." Unquote. Living in a culture where we are encouraged to seek a quick release from any pain or discomfort has fostered a nation of individuals who are easily devastated by emotional pain, however relative. When we face pain in relationships, our first response is often to sever bonds rather than to maintain commitment. When conflict arises within us or between us and other individuals when we walk on love's path, it is disheartening, especially when we cannot easily right our difficulties. In the case of romantic relationships, many people fear getting trapped in a bond that is not working, so they flee at the onset of conflict or they self-indulgently create unnecessary conflict as a way to avoid commitment. They flee from love before they feel its grace. Pain may be the threshold they must cross to partake of love's bliss. Running from the pain, they never know the fullness of love's pleasure. False notions of love teach us that it is the place where we will feel no pain, where we will be in a state of constant bliss. We have to expose the falseness of these beliefs to see and accept the reality that suffering and pain do not end when we begin to love. In some cases, when we are making the slow journey back from lovelessness to love, our suffering may become more intense. As the lyrics of our old-time spirituals testify, quote, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Unquote. Acceptance of pain is part of loving practice. It enables us to distinguish constructive suffering from self-indulgent hurt. When love's promise has never been fulfilled in our lives, it is perhaps the most difficult practice of love to trust that the passage through the painful abyss leads to paradise. Guy Corneau suggests in Lessons in Love that many men are so fearful of feeling the emotional pain that has been locked away inside them for so long that they willingly choose a life of lovelessness. Quote, a good number of men simply decide not to commit themselves because they cannot face dealing with the emotional pain of love and the conflict it engenders, unquote. Women are often belittled for trying to resurrect these men and bring them back to life and to love. They are, in fact, the real sleeping beauties. We might be living in a world that would be even more alienated and violent if caring women did not do the work of teaching men who have lost touch with themselves how to live again. This labor of love is futile only when the men in question refuse to awaken, refuse growth. At this point, it is a gesture of self-love for women to break their commitment and move on. Women have endeavored to guide men to love because patriarchal thinking has sanctioned this work, even as it has undermined it by teaching men to refuse guidance. It sets up a gendered arrangement in which men are more likely to get their emotional needs met while women will be deprived. Getting your emotional needs met helps create greater psychological well-being. As a consequence, men are given an advantage that neatly coincides with the patriarchal insistence that they are superior and therefore better suited to rule others. Were women's emotional needs met, were mutuality the norm, male domination might lose its allure. Sadly, the men's movement that emerged in response to the feminist critique of sexist masculinity often encouraged men to get in touch with their feeling, but to share them only in a quote-unquote safe context, usually only with other men. Robert Bly, a major leader of this movement, had little to say about men and love. 
men in the movement did not urge one another to look to enlightened women for guidance in the way of love. Those who choose to walk on love's path are well served if they have a guide. That guide can enable us to overcome fear if we trust that they will not lead us astray or abandon us along the way. I am always amazed by how much courageous trust we offer strangers. We get sick and enter hospitals where we put our trust in a collective body of people we don't know, who we hope will make us well. Yet we often fear placing our emotional trust in caring individuals who may have been faithful friends all our lives. This is simply misguided thinking, and it must be overcome if we are to be transformed by love. The practice of love takes time. Without a doubt, the way we work in the society leaves individuals with little time when they are not physically and emotionally tired to work on the art of loving. How many times do we hear anyone say that they were working so hard and had no time for love, so they had to cut back or even leave a job or make a space to be loving? While movies like Regarding Henry and the Fisher King spin sentimental narratives about ruling class men suffering life-threatening illnesses that lead them to reevaluate how they spend their time, in real life we have yet to see abundant examples of powerful men or women pausing to create a place to do the work of love in their lives. Certainly, individuals who love someone who is more preoccupied by work feel immense frustration when they endeavor to guide their partner in the way of love. Truly, there would be no unemployment problem in our nation if our taxes subsidized schools where everyone could learn to love. Job sharing could become the norm. With love at the center of our lives, work could have a different meaning and focus. When we practice love, we want to give more. Selfishness, a refusal to give acceptance to another, is a central reason romantic relationships fail. In love, the way you want it. Robert Sternberg confirms, quote, If I were asked the single most frequent cause of the destruction of relationships, I would say it is selfishness. We live in an age of narcissism, and many people have never learned or have forgotten how to listen to the needs of others. The truth is, if you want to make just one change in yourself that will improve your relationship, literally overnight, it would be to put your partner's interest on an equal footing with your own, unquote. Giving generously in romantic relationships and in all other bonds means recognizing when the other person needs our attention. Attention is an important resource. Generous sharing of all resources is one concrete way to express love. These resources can be time, attention, material objects, skills, money, etc. Once we embark on love's path, we see how easy it is to give. A useful gift all love's practitioners can give is the offering of forgiveness. It not only allows us to move away from blame, from seeing others as the cause of our sustained lovelessness, but it enables us to experience agency, to know we can be responsible for giving and finding love. We need not blame others for feelings of lack, for we know how to attend to them. We know how to give ourselves love and to recognize the love that is all around us. Much of the anger and rage we feel about emotional lack is released when we forgive ourselves and others. Forgiveness opens us up and prepares us to receive love. It prepares the way for us to give wholeheartedly. Giving brings us into communion with everyone. It is one way for us to understand that there is truly enough of everything for everybody. In the Christian tradition, we are told that giving, quote, opens the windows of heaven, unquote, so that we can be offered, quote, a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive, unquote. In patriarchal society, men who want to break with domination can best begin the practice of love by being giving, by being generous. This is why feminist thinkers extolled the virtues of male parenting. Working as caregivers to young children, many men are able to experience for the first time the joy that comes from service. Through giving to each other, we learn how to experience mutuality. 
To heal the gender war rooted in struggles for power, women and men choose to make mutuality the basis of their bond, ensuring that each person's growth matters and is nurtured. It enhances our power to know joy. In A Heart as Wide as the World, Sharon Salzberg reminds us, quote, the practice of generosity frees us from the sense of isolation that arises from clinging and attachment, unquote. Cultivating a generous heart, which is, as Salzburg writes, quote, the primary quality of an awakened mind, unquote, strengthens romantic bonds. Giving is the way we also learn how to receive. The mutual practice of giving and receiving is an everyday ritual when we know true love. A generous heart is always open, always ready to receive our going and coming. In the midst of such love, we need never fear abandonment. This is the most precious gift true love offers, the experience of knowing we always belong. Giving is healing to the spirit. We are admonished by spiritual tradition to give gifts to those who would know love. Love is an action, a participatory emotion. Whether we are engaged in a process of self-love or of loving others, we must move beyond the realm of feeling to actualize love. This is why it is useful to see love as a practice. When we act, we need not feel inadequate or powerless. We can trust that there are concrete steps to take on love's path. We learn to communicate, to be still, and listen to the needs of our hearts, and we learn to listen to others. We learn compassion by being willing to hear the pain, as well as the joy of those we love. The path to love is not arduous or hidden, but we must choose to take the first step. If we do not know the way, there is always a loving spirit with an enlightened, open mind able to show us how to take the path that leads to the heart of love the path that lets us return to love. This has been All About Love, New Visions, written by Bell Hooks, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. This was Chapter 9, Mutuality, The Heart of Love. Thanks for reading with me.